preface to round the fire stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david wales round the fire stories by arthur conan doyle preface in a previous volume the green flag i have assembled a number of my stories which deal with warfare or with sport in the present collection those have been brought together which are concerned with the grotesque and with the terrible such tales as might well be read round the fire upon a winter's night this would be my ideal atmosphere for such stories if an author might choose his time and place as an artist does the light and hanging of his picture however if they have the good fortune to give pleasure to any one at any time or place their author will be very satisfied arthur conan doyle windlesham crowborough end of preface story one of round the fire stories by arthur conan doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain story one the leather funnel my friend lionel dacre lived in the avenue de wagram paris his house was that small one with the iron railings and grass plot in front of it on the left-hand side as you pass down from the arc de triomphe i fancy that it had been there long before the avenue was constructed for the grey tiles were stained with lichens and the walls were mildewed and discoloured with age it looked a small house from the street five windows in front if i remember right but it deepened into a single long chamber at the back it was here that dacre had that singular library of occult literature and the fantastic curiosities which served as a hobby for himself and an amusement for his friends a wealthy man of refined and eccentric tastes he had spent much of his life and fortune in gathering together what was said to be a unique private collection of talmudic cabalistic and magical works many of them of great rarity and value his tastes leaned toward the marvellous and the monstrous and i have heard that his experiments in the direction of the unknown have passed all the bounds of civilization and of decorum to his english friends he never alluded to such matters and took the tone of the student and virtuoso but a frenchman whose tastes were of the same nature has assured me that the worst excesses of the black mass have been perpetrated in that large and lofty hall which is lined with the shelves of his books and the cases of his museum dacre's appearance was enough to show that his deep interest in these psychic matters was intellectual rather than spiritual there was no trace of asceticism upon his heavy face but there was much mental force in his huge dome-like skull which curved upward from amongst his thinning locks like a snow-peak above its fringe of fir-trees his knowledge was greater than his wisdom and his powers were far superior to his character the small bright eyes buried deeply in his fleshy face twinkled with intelligence and an unabated curiosity of life but they were the eyes of a sensualist and an egotist enough of the man for he is dead now poor devil dead at the very time that he had made sure that he had at last discovered the elixir of life it is not with his complex character that i have to deal but with the very strange and inexplicable incident which had its rise in my visit to him in the early spring of the year eighty two i had known dacre in england for my researches in the assyrian room of the british museum had been conducted at the time when he was endeavouring to establish a mystic and esoteric meaning in the babylonian tablets and this community of interests had brought us together chance remarks had led to daily conversation and that to something verging upon friendship i had promised him that on my next visit to paris i would call upon him at the time when i was able to fulfil my compact i was living in a cottage at fontainebleau and as the evening trains were inconvenient he asked me to spend the night in his house i have only one spare couch said he pointing to a broad sofa in his large salon i hope that you will manage to be comfortable there it was a singular bedroom with its high walls of brown volumes but there could be no more agreeable furniture to a bookworm like myself 
and there is no scent so pleasant to my nostrils as that faint subtle reek which comes from an ancient book i assured him that i could desire no more charming chamber and no more congenial surroundings if the fittings are neither convenient nor conventional they are at least costly said he looking round at his shelves i have expended nearly a quarter of a million of money upon these objects which surround you books weapons gems carvings tapestries images there is hardly a thing here which has not its history and it is generally one worth telling he was seated as he spoke at one side of the open fireplace and i at the other his reading-table was on his right, and the strong lamp above it ringed it with a very vivid circle of golden light. A half-rolled palimpsest lay in the centre, and around it were many quaint articles of bric-a-brac. One of these was a large funnel, such as is used for filling wine-casks. It appeared to be made of black wood, and to be rimmed with discoloured brass. "'That is a curious thing,' I remarked. "'What is the history of that?' ah said he it is the very question which i have had occasion to ask myself i would give a good deal to know take it in your hands and examine it i did so and found that what i had imagined to be wood was in reality leather though age had dried it into an extreme hardness it was a large funnel and might hold a quart when full the brass rim encircled the wide end but the narrow was also tipped with metal what do you make of it asked dacre i should imagine that it belonged to some vintner or maltster in the middle ages said i i have seen in england leathern drinking flagons of the seventeenth century blackjacks as they were called which were of the same colour and hardness as this filler i dare say that the date would be about the same said dacre and no doubt also it was used for filling a vessel with liquid if my suspicions are correct however it was a queer vintner who used it and a very singular cask which was filled do you observe nothing strange at the spout end of the funnel as i held it to the light i observed that at a spot some five inches above the brass tip the narrow neck of the leather funnel was all haggled and scored as if some one had notched it round with a blunt knife only at that point was there any roughening of the dead black surface some one has tried to cut off the neck would you call it a cut it is torn and lacerated it must have taken some strength to leave those marks on such tough material whatever the instrument may have been but what do you think of it i can tell that you know more than you say dacre smiled and his little eyes twinkled with knowledge have you included the psychology of dreams among your learned studies he asked well, i did not even know that there was such a psychology my dear sir that shelf above the gem case is filled with volumes from albertus magnus onward which deal with no other subject it is a science in itself a science of charlatans the charlatan is always the pioneer from the astrologer came the astronomer from the alchemist the chemist from the mesmerist the experimental psychologist the quack of yesterday is the professor of tomorrow even such subtle and elusive things as dreams will in time be reduced to system and order when that time comes the researches of our friends in the bookshelf yonder will no longer be the amusement of the mystic but the foundations of a science well supposing that is so what has the science of dreams to do with the large black brass-rimmed funnel i will tell you you know that i have an agent who is always on the lookout for rarities and curiosities for my collection some days ago he heard of a dealer upon one of the keys who had acquired some old rubbish found in a cupboard in an ancient house at the back of the rue maturin in the quartier latin the dining-room of this old house is decorated with a coat of arms chevrons and bars rouge upon a field argent which prove upon inquiry to be the shield of nicholas de la reine a high official of king louis the fourteenth there can be no doubt that the other articles in the cupboard date back to the early days of the king the inference is therefore that they were all the property of this nicholas de la reine who was as i understand the gentleman specially concerned with the maintenance and execution of the draconic laws of that epoch what then 
i would ask you now to take the funnel into your hands once more and to examine the upper brass rim can you make out any lettering upon it there were certainly some scratches upon it almost obliterated by time the general effect was of several letters the last of which bore some resemblance to a b you make it a b oh yes i do so do i in fact i have no doubt whatever that it is a b but the nobleman you mentioned would have had r for his initial exactly that's the beauty of it he owned this curious object and yet he had someone else's initials upon it why did he do this i can't imagine can you well i might perhaps guess do you observe something drawn a little further along the rim i should say it was a crown it is undoubtedly a crown but if you examine it in good light you will convince yourself that it is not an ordinary crown it is a heraldic crown a badge of rank and it consists of an alternation of four pearls and strawberry leaves the proper badge of a marquis we may infer therefore that the person whose initials end in b was entitled to wear that coronet then this common leather filler belonged to a marquis dacre gave a peculiar smile or to some member of the family of a marquis said he so much we have clearly gathered from this engraved rim but what has all this to do with dreams i do not know whether it was from a look upon dacre's face or from some subtle suggestion in his manner but a feeling of repulsion of unreasoning horror came upon me as i looked at the gnarled old lump of leather i have more than once received important information through my dreams said my companion in the didactic manner which he loved to affect i make it a rule now when i am in doubt upon any material point to place the article in question beside me as i sleep and to hope for some enlightenment the process does not appear to me to be very obscure though it has not yet received the blessing of orthodox science according to my theory any object which has been intimately associated with any supreme paroxysm of human emotion whether it be joy or pain will retain a certain atmosphere or association which it is capable of communicating to a sensitive mind by a sensitive mind i do not mean an abnormal one but such a trained and educated mind as you or i possess you mean for example that if i slept beside that old sword upon the wall i might dream of some bloody incident in which that very sword took part an excellent example for as a matter of fact that sword was used in that fashion by me and i saw in my sleep the death of its owner who perished in a brisk skirmish which i have been unable to identify but which occurred at the time of the wars of the frondists if you think of it some of our popular observances show that the fact has already been recognized by our ancestors although we in our wisdom have classed it among superstitions for example well the placing of the bride's cake beneath the pillow in order that the sleeper may have pleasant dreams that is one of several instances which you will find set forth in a small brochure which i am myself writing upon the subject but to come back to the point i slept one night with this funnel beside me and i had a dream which certainly throws a curious light upon its use and origin well, what did you dream i dreamed he paused and an intent look of interest came over his massive face by jove that's well thought of said he this really will be an exceedingly interesting experiment you are yourself a psychic subject with nerves which respond readily to any impression well i've never tested myself in that direction then we shall test you to-night might i ask you as a very great favour when you occupy that couch to-night to sleep with this old funnel placed by the side of your pillow the request seemed to me a grotesque one but i have myself in my complex nature a hunger after all which is bizarre and fantastic i had not the faintest belief in dacre's theory nor any hopes for success in such an experiment yet it amused me that the experiment should be made 
dacre with great gravity drew a small stand to the head of my settee and placed the funnel upon it then after a short conversation he wished me good night and left me i sat for some time smoking by the smouldering fire and turning over in my mind the curious incident which had occurred and the strange experience which might lie before me skeptical as i was there was something impressive in the assurance of dacre's manner and my extraordinary surroundings the huge room with the strange and often sinister objects which were hung around it struck solemnity into my soul finally i undressed and turning out the lamp i lay down after long tossing i fell asleep let me try to describe as accurately as i can the scene which came to me in my dreams it stands out now in my memory more clearly than anything which i have seen with my waking eyes there was a room which bore the appearance of a vault four spandrels from the corners ran up to join a sharp cup-shaped roof the architecture was rough but very strong it was evidently part of a great building three men in black with curious top-heavy black velvet hats sat in a line upon a red carpeted dais their faces were very solemn and sad on the left stood two long-gowned men with portfolios in their hands which seemed to be stuffed with papers upon the right looking toward me was a small woman with blonde hair and singular light blue eyes the eyes of a child she was past her first youth but could not yet be called middle-aged her figure was inclined to stoutness and her bearing was proud and confident her face was pale but serene it was a curious face comely and yet feline with a subtle suggestion of cruelty about the straight strong little mouth and chubby jaw she was draped in some sort of loose white gown beside her stood a thin eager priest who whispered in her ear and continually raised a crucifix before her eyes she turned her head and looked fixedly past the crucifix at the three men in black who were i felt her judges as i gazed the three men stood up and said something but i could distinguish no words though i was aware that it was the central one who was speaking they then swept out of the room followed by the two men with the papers at the same instant several rough-looking fellows in stout jerkins came bustling in and removed first the red carpet and then the boards which formed the dais so as to entirely clear the room when this screen was removed i saw some singular articles of furniture behind it one looked like a bed with wooden rollers at each end and a winch handle to regulate its length another was a wooden horse there were several other curious objects and a number of swinging cords which played over pulleys it was not unlike a modern gymnasium when the room had been cleared there appeared a new figure upon the scene this was a tall thin person clad in black with a gaunt and austere face the aspect of the man made me shudder his clothes were all shining with grease and mottled with stains he bore himself with a slow and impressive dignity as if he took command of all things from the instant of his entrance in spite of his rude appearance and sordid dress it was now his business his room his to command he carried a coil of light ropes over his left forearm the lady looked him up and down with a searching glance but her expression was unchanged it was confident even defiant but it was very different with the priest his face was ghastly white and i saw the moisture glisten and run on his high sloping forehead he threw up his hands in prayer and he stooped continually to mutter frantic words in the lady's ear the man in black now advanced and taking one of the cords from his left arm he bound the woman's hands together she held them meekly towards him as he did so then he took her arm with a rough grip and led her toward the wooden horse which was little higher than her waist on to this she was lifted and laid with her back upon it and her face to the ceiling while the priest quivering with horror had rushed out of the room 
the woman's lips were moving rapidly and though i could hear nothing i knew that she was praying her feet hung down on either side of the horse and i saw that the rough varlets in attendance had fastened cords to her ankles and secured the other ends to iron rings in the stone floor my heart sank within me as i saw these ominous preparations and yet i was held by the fascination of horror and i could not take my eyes from the strange spectacle a man had entered the room with a bucket of water in either hand another followed with a third bucket they were laid beside the wooden horse the second man had a wooden dipper a bowl with a straight handle in his other hand this he gave to the man in black at the same moment one of the varlets approached with a dark object in his hand which even in my dream filled me with a vague feeling of familiarity it was a leathern filler with horrible energy he thrust it but i could stand no more my hair stood on end with horror i writhed i struggled i broke through the bonds of sleep and i burst with a shriek into my own life and found myself lying shivering with terror in the huge library with the moonlight flooding through the window and throwing strange silver and black traceries upon the opposite wall oh what a blessed relief to feel that i was back in the nineteenth century back out of that medieval vault into a world where men had human hearts within their bosoms i sat up on my couch trembling in every limb my mind divided between thankfulness and horror to think that such things were ever done that they could be done without god striking the villains dead was it all a fantasy or did it really stand for something which had happened in the black cruel days of the world's history i sank my throbbing head upon my shaking hands and then suddenly my heart seemed to stand still in my bosom and i could not even scream so great was my terror something was advancing toward me through the darkness of the room it is a horror coming upon a horror which breaks a man's spirit i could not reason i could not pray i could only sit like a frozen image and glare at the dark figure which was coming down the great room and then it moved out into the white lane of moonlight and i breathed once more it was dacre and his face showed that he was as frightened as myself was that you for god's sake what's the matter he asked in a husky voice oh dacre i am so glad to see you i have been down into hell it was dreadful then it was you who screamed i dare say it was it rang through the house the servants are all terrified he struck a match and lit the lamp i think we may get the fire to burn up again he added throwing some logs upon the embers good god my dear chap how white you are you look as if you had seen a ghost so i have several ghosts the leather funnel has acted then i wouldn't sleep near the infernal thing again for all the money you could offer me dacre chuckled i expected that you would have a lively night of it said he you took it out of me in return for that scream of yours wasn't a very pleasant sound at two in the morning i suppose from what you say that you have seen the whole dreadful business what dreadful business the torture of the water the extraordinary question as it was called in the genial days of le roi soleil did you stand it out to the end no thank god i awoke before it really began ah it is just as well for you i held out till the third bucket well it is an old story and they are all in their graves now anyhow so what does it matter how they got there i suppose that you have no idea what it was that you have seen the torture of some criminal she must have been a terrible malefactor indeed if her crimes are in proportion to her penalty well we have that small consolation said dacre wrapping his dressing-gown round him and crouching closer to the fire they were in proportion to her penalty that is to say if i am correct in the lady's identity how could you possibly know her identity for answer dacre took down an old vellum-coloured volume from the shelf just listen to this said he it is in the french of the seventeenth century but i will give a rough translation as i go 
You will judge for yourself whether I have solved the riddle or not. The prisoner was brought before the grand chambers and tournelles of Parliament, sitting as a court of justice, charged with the murder of Master Dreux d'Aubray, her father, and of her two brothers, Messieurs d'Aubray, one being civil lieutenant and the other a councillor of Parliament. In person it seemed hard to believe that she had really done such wicked deeds, for she was of a mild appearance and of short stature, with a fair skin and blue eyes yet the court having found her guilty condemned her to the ordinary and to the extraordinary question in order that she might be forced to name her accomplices after which she should be carried in a cart to the place de greve there to have her head cut off her body being afterwards burned and her ashes scattered to the winds the date of this entry is july sixteenth sixteen seventy six it is interesting said i but not convincing how do you prove the two women to be the same i am coming to that the narrative goes on to tell of the woman's behaviour when questioned when the executioner approached her she recognised him by the cords which he held in his hands and she at once held out her own hands to him looking at him from head to foot without uttering a word how's that yes it was so she gave without wincing upon the wooden horse and rings which had twisted so many limbs and caused so many shrieks of agony when her eyes fell upon the three pails of water which were all ready for her she said with a smile all that water must have been brought here for the purpose of drowning me monsieur you have no idea i trust of making a person of my small stature swallow it all shall i read the details of the torture oh no for heaven's sake don't here is a sentence which must surely show you that what is here recorded is the very scene which you have gazed upon to-night the good abbe pierrot unable to contemplate the agonies which were suffered by his penitent had hurried from the room does that convince you oh, it does entirely there can be no question that it is indeed the same event but who then is this lady whose appearance was so attractive and whose end was so horrible for answer dacre came across to me and placed the small lamp upon the table which stood by my bed lifting up the ill-omened filler he turned the brass rim so that the light fell full upon it seen in this way the engraving seemed clearer than on the night before we have already agreed that this is the badge of a marquis or of a marquise said he we have also settled that the last letter is b oh it is undoubtedly so i now suggest to you that the other letters from left to right are m m a small d a a small d and then the final b yes i am sure that you are right i can make out the two small d's quite plainly what i have read to you to-night said dacre is the official record of the trial of marie madeleine d'aubray marquise de brinvilliers one of the most famous poisoners and murderers of all time i sat in silence overwhelmed at the extraordinary nature of the incident and at the completeness of the proof with which dacre had exposed its real meaning in a vague way i remembered some details of the woman's career her unbridled debauchery the cold-blooded and protracted torture of her sick father the murder of her brothers for motives of petty gain i recollected also that the bravery of her end had done something to atone for the horror of her life and that all paris had sympathized with her last moments and blessed her as a martyr within a few days of the time when they had cursed her as a murderess one objection and one only occurred to my mind how came her initials and her badge of rank upon the filler surely they did not carry their medieval homage to the nobility to the point of decorating instruments of torture with their titles i was puzzled with the same point said dacre but it admits of a simple explanation the case excited extraordinary interest at the time and nothing could be more natural than that la reynie the head of the police should retain this filler as a grim souvenir it was not often that a marchioness of france underwent the extraordinary question 
that he should engrave her initials upon it for the information of others was surely a very ordinary proceeding upon his part and this i asked pointing to the marks upon the leather neck she was a cruel tigress said dacre as he turned away i think it is evident that like other tigresses her teeth were both strong and sharp end of story one story two of round the fire stories by arthur conan doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain story two the beetle hunter a curious experience said the doctor yes my friends i have had one very curious experience i never expect to have another for it is against all doctrines of chances that two such events would befall any one man in a single lifetime you may believe me or not but the thing happened exactly as i tell it i had just become a medical man but i had not started in practice and i lived in rooms on gower street the street has been renumbered since then but it was in the only house which has a bow window upon the left-hand side as you go down from the metropolitan station a widow named murchison kept the house at that time and she had three medical students and one engineer as lodgers i occupied the top room which was the cheapest but cheap as it was it was more than i could afford my small resources were dwindling away and every week it became more necessary that i should find something to do yet i was very unwilling to go into general practice for my tastes were all in the direction of science and especially of zoology towards which i had always a strong leaning i had almost given the fight up and resigned myself to being a medical drudge for life when the turning point of my struggles came in a very extraordinary way one morning i had picked up the standard and was glancing over its contents there was a complete absence of news and i was about to toss the paper down again when my eyes were caught by an advertisement at the head of the personal column it was worded in this way wanted for one or more days the services of a medical man it is essential that he should be a man of strong physique of steady nerves and of a resolute nature must be an entomologist coleopterist preferred apply in person at seventy seven b brook street application must be made before twelve o'clock to-day now i have already said that i was devoted to zoology of all branches of zoology the study of insects was the most attractive to me and of all insects beetles were the species with which i was most familiar butterfly collectors are numerous but beetles are far more varied and more accessible in these islands than are butterflies it was this fact which had attracted my attention to them and i had myself made a collection which numbered some hundred varieties as to the other requisites of the advertisement i knew that my nerves could be depended upon and i had won the weight-throwing competition at the inter-hospital sports clearly i was the very man for the vacancy within five minutes of my having read the advertisement i was in a cab and on my way to brook street as i drove i kept turning the matter over in my head and trying to make a guess as to what sort of employment it could be which needed such curious qualifications a strong physique a resolute nature a medical training and a knowledge of beetles what connection could there be between these various requisites and then there was the disheartening fact that the situation was not a permanent one but terminable from day to day according to the terms of the advertisement the more i pondered over it the more unintelligible did it become but at the end of my meditations i always came back to the ground fact that come what might i had nothing to lose that i was completely at the end of my resources and that i was ready for any adventure however desperate which would put a few honest sovereigns into my pocket the man fears to fail who has to pay for his failure but there was no penalty which fortune could exact from me i was like the gambler with empty pockets who is still allowed to try his luck with the others 
number seventy seven b brook street was one of those dingy and yet imposing houses dun-coloured and flat-faced with the intensely respectable and solid air which marks the georgian builder as i alighted from the cab a young man came out of the door and walked swiftly down the street in passing me i noticed that he cast an inquisitive and a somewhat malevolent glance at me and i took the incident as a good omen for his appearance was that of a rejected candidate and if he resented my application it meant that the vacancy was not yet filled up full of hope i ascended the broad steps and rapped with a heavy knocker a footman in powder and livery opened the door clearly i was in touch with people of wealth and fashion yes sir said the footman i came in answer to uh, quite so sir said the footman lord lynchmere will see you at once in the library lord lynchmere i had vaguely heard the name but could not for the instant recall anything about him following the footman i was shown into a large book-lined room in which there was seated behind a writing-desk a small man with a pleasant clean-shaven mobile face and long hair shot with grey brushed back from his forehead he looked me up and down with a very shrewd penetrating glance holding the card which the footman had given him in his right hand then he smiled pleasantly and i felt that externally at any rate i possessed the qualifications which he desired you have come in answer to my advertisement dr hamilton he asked yes sir do you fulfil the conditions which are there laid down i believe that i do you are a powerful man so i should judge from your appearance i think that i am fairly strong and resolute oh i believe so have you ever known what it was to be exposed to imminent danger no i don't know that i ever have but you think you would be prompt and cool at such a time i hope so well i believe that you would i have the more confidence in you because you do not pretend to be certain as to what you would do in a position that was new to you my impression is that so far as personal qualities go you are the very man of whom i am in search that being settled we may pass on to the next point which is to talk to me about beetles i looked across to see if he was joking but on the contrary he was leaning eagerly forward across his desk and there was an expression of something like anxiety in his eyes i am afraid that you do not know about beetles he cried on the contrary sir it is the one scientific subject about which i feel that i really do know something i am overjoyed to hear it please talk to me about beetles i talked i do not profess to have said anything original upon the subject but i gave a short sketch of the characteristics of the beetle and ran over the more common species with some allusions to the specimens in my own little collection and to the article upon burying beetles which i had contributed to the journal of entomological science what not a collector cried lord lynchmere you don't mean that you are yourself a collector his eyes danced with pleasure at the thought you are certainly the very man in london for my purpose i thought that among five millions of people there must be such a man but the difficulty is to lay one's hands upon him i have been extraordinarily fortunate in finding you he rang a gong upon the table and the footman entered ask lady rossiter to have the goodness to step this way said his lordship and a few moments later the lady was ushered into the room she was a small middle-aged woman very like lord lynchmere in appearance with the same quick alert features and grey-black hair the expression of anxiety however which i had observed upon his face was very much more marked upon hers some great grief seemed to have cast its shadow over her features as lord lynchmere presented me she turned her face full upon me and i was shocked to observe a half-healed scar extending for two inches over her right eyebrow it was partly concealed by plaster but none the less i could see that it had been a serious wound and not long inflicted dr hamilton is the very man for our purpose evelyn said lord lynchmere he is actually a collector of beetles and he has written articles upon the subject 
Really? said Lady Rossiter. Then you must have heard of my husband. Every one who knows anything about beetles must have heard of Sir Thomas Rossiter. For the first time a thin little ray of light began to break into the obscure business. Here at last was a connection between these people and beetles. Sir Thomas Rossiter, he was the greatest authority upon the subject in the world. He had made it his lifelong study, and had written a most exhaustive work upon it. I hastened to assure her that I had read and appreciated it. "'Have you met my husband?' she asked. "'No, I have not.' "'But you shall,' said Lord Lynchmere, with decision. The lady was standing beside the desk, and she put her hand upon his shoulder. It was obvious to me, as I saw their faces together, that they were brother and sister. "'Are you really prepared for this, Charles? It is noble of you, but you fill me with fears.' Her voice quavered with apprehension, and he appeared to me to be equally moved, though he was making strong efforts to conceal his agitation. "'Yes, yes, dear, it is all settled, it is all decided. In fact, there is no other possible way that I can see.' "'There is one obvious way. No, no, Evelyn, I shall never abandon you, never.' it will come right depend upon it it will come right and surely it looks like the interference of providence that so perfect an instrument should be put into our hands my position was embarrassing for i felt that for the instant they had forgotten my presence but lord lynchmere came back suddenly to me and to my engagement the business for which i want you dr hamilton is that you should put yourself absolutely at my disposal I wish you to come for a short journey with me, to remain always at my side, and to promise to do without question whatever I may ask you, however unreasonable it may appear to you to be. That is a good deal to ask, said I. Unfortunately, I cannot put it more plainly, for I do not myself know what turn matters may take. You may be sure, however, that you will not be asked to do anything which your conscience does not approve and I promise you that when it is all over you will be proud to have been concerned in so good a work. "'If it ends happily,' said the lady. "'Exactly, if it ends happily,' his lordship repeated. "'And terms?' I asked. Twenty pounds a day.' I was amazed at the sum, and must have showed my surprise upon my features. It is a rare combination of qualities, as must have struck you when you first read the advertisement, said Lord Lynchmere. Such varied gifts may well command a high return, and I do not conceal from you that your duties might be arduous or even dangerous. Besides, it is possible that one or two days may bring the matter to an end. Please, God, sighed his sister. So now, Dr. Hamilton, may I rely upon your aid? most undoubtedly said i you have only to tell me what my duties are your first duty will be to return to your home you will pack up whatever you may need for a short visit to the country we start together from paddington station at three forty this afternoon do we go far as far as pangbourne meet me at the bookstall at three thirty i shall have the tickets good-bye dr hamilton and by the way, there are two things which I should be very glad if you would bring with you in case you have them. One is your case for collecting beetles, and the other is a stick, and the thicker and heavier the better. You may imagine that I had plenty to think of from the time that I left Brook Street until I set out to meet Lord Lynchmere at Paddington. The whole fantastic business kept arranging and rearranging itself in kaleidoscopic forms inside my brain, until I had thought out a dozen explanations, each of them more grotesquely improbable than the last. And yet I felt that the truth must be something grotesquely improbable also. At last I gave up all attempts at finding a solution, and contented myself with exactly carrying out the instructions which I had received. With a hand valise, specimen case, and a loaded cane, I was waiting at the Paddington bookstall when Lord Lynchmere arrived. He was an even smaller man than I had thought, frail and peaky, with a manner which was more nervous than it had been in the morning. 
he wore a long thick travelling ulster and i observed that he carried a heavy blackthorn cudgel in his hand i have the tickets said he leading the way up the platform this is our train i have engaged a carriage for i am particularly anxious to impress one or two things upon you while we travel down and yet all that he had to impress upon me might have been said in a sentence for it was that i was to remember that i was there as a protection to himself and that i was not on any consideration to leave him for an instant this he repeated again and again as our journey drew to a close with an insistence which showed that his nerves were thoroughly shaken yes he said at last in answer to my looks rather than to my words i am nervous dr hamilton i have always been a timid man and my timidity depends upon my frail physical health but my soul is firm and i can bring myself up to face a danger which a less nervous man might shrink from what i am doing now is done from no compulsion but entirely from a sense of duty and yet it is beyond doubt a desperate risk if things should go wrong i will have some claims to the title of martyr this eternal reading of riddles was too much for me i felt that i must put a term to it i think it would be very much better sir if you were to trust me entirely said i it is impossible for me to act effectively when i do not know what are the objects which we have in view or even where we are going oh as to where we are going there need be no mystery about that said he we are going to delamere court the residence of sir thomas rossiter with whose work you are so conversant as to the exact object of our visit i do not know that at this stage of the proceedings anything should be gained dr hamilton by my taking you into my complete confidence i may tell you that we are acting i say we because my sister lady rossiter takes the same view as myself with the one object of preventing anything in the nature of a family scandal that being so you can understand that i am loath to give any explanations which are not absolutely necessary it would be a different matter dr hamilton if i were asking your advice as matters stand it is only your active help which i need and i will indicate to you from time to time how you can best give it there was nothing more to be said and a poor man can put up with a good deal for twenty pounds a day but i felt none the less that lord lynchmere was acting rather scurvily towards me he wished to convert me into a passive tool like the blackthorn in his hand with his sensitive disposition i could imagine however that scandal would be abhorrent to him and i realized that he would not take me into his confidence until no other course was open to him i must trust to my own eyes and ears to solve the mystery but i had every confidence that i should not trust to them in vain delamere court lies a good five miles from pangbourne station and we drove for that distance in an open fly lord lynchmere sat in deep thought during the time and he never opened his mouth until we were close to our destination when he did speak it was to give me a piece of information which surprised me perhaps you are not aware said he that i am a medical man like yourself no sir i did not know it yes i qualified in my younger days when there were several lives between me and the peerage i have not had occasion to practice but i have found it a useful education all the same i never regretted the years which i devoted to medical study these are the gates of delamere court we had come to two high pillars crowned with heraldic monsters which flanked the opening of a winding avenue over the laurel bushes and rhododendrons i could see a long many-gabled mansion girded with ivy and toned to the warm cheery mellow glow of old brickwork my eyes were still fixed in admiration upon this delightful house when my companion plucked nervously at my sleeve here sir thomas he whispered please talk beetle all you can a tall thin figure curiously angular and bony had emerged through a gap in the hedge of laurels in his hand he held a spud and he wore gauntleted gardener's gloves a broad-brimmed gray hat cast his face into shadow 
but it struck me as exceedingly austere, with an ill-nourished beard and harsh, irregular features. The fly pulled up, and Lord Lynchmere sprang out. "'My dear Thomas, how are you?' said he, heartily. But the heartiness was by no means reciprocal. The owner of the grounds glared at me over his brother-in-law's shoulder, and I caught broken scraps of sentences. "'Well-known wishes, hatred of strangers, unjustifiable intrusion, perfectly inexcusable.' Then there was a muttered explanation, and the two of them came over together to the side of the fly. "'Let me present to you Sir Thomas Rossiter, Dr. Hamilton,' said Lord Lynchmere. "'You will find that you have a strong community of tastes.' I bowed. Sir Thomas stood very stiffly, looking at me severely from under the broad brim of his hat. "'Lord Lynchmere tells me that you know something about beetles,' said he. "'What do you know about beetles?' "'I know what I have learned from your work upon the Coleoptera, Sir Thomas,' I answered. "'Give me the names of the better-known species of the British scarabee,' said he. I had not expected an examination, but fortunately I was ready for one. My answers seemed to please him, for his stern features relaxed. "'You appear to have read my book with some profit, sir,' said he. "'It is a rare thing for me to meet any one who takes an intelligent interest in such matters. People can find time for such trivialities as sport or society, and yet the beetles are overlooked. I can assure you that the greater part of the idiots in this part of the country are unaware that I have ever written a book at all. I, the first man who ever described the true function of the elytra. I am glad to see you, sir, and I have no doubt that I can show you some specimens which will interest you. He stepped into the fly and drove up with us to the house, expounding to me as we went some recent researches which he had made into the anatomy of the ladybird. I have said that Sir Thomas Rossiter wore a large hat drawn down over his brows. As he entered the hall he uncovered himself, and I was at once aware of a singular characteristic which the hat had concealed. His forehead, which was naturally high, and higher still on account of receding hair, was in a continual state of movement. Some nervous weakness kept the muscles in a constant spasm, which sometimes produced a mere twitching, and sometimes a curious rotary movement unlike anything which I had ever seen before. It was strikingly visible as he turned towards us after entering the study, and seemed the more singular from the contrast with the hard steady grey eyes which looked out from underneath those palpitating brows. "'I am sorry,' said he, "'that Lady Rossiter is not here to help me to welcome you. By the way, Charles, did Evelyn say anything about the date of her return?' She wished to stay in town for a few more days, said Lord Lynchmere. You know how ladies' social duties accumulate if they have been for some time in the country. My sister has many old friends in London at present. Well, she is her own mistress, and I should not wish to alter her plans, but I shall be glad when I see her again. It is very lonely here without her company. I was afraid that you might find it so, and that was partly why I ran down. My young friend, Dr. Hamilton, is so much interested in the subject which you have made your own that I thought you would not mind his accompanying me. I lead a retired life, Dr. Hamilton, and my aversion to strangers grows upon me, said our host. I have sometimes thought that my nerves are not so good as they were. My travels in search of beetles in my younger days took me into many malarious and unhealthy places. But a brother coleopterist like yourself is always a welcome guest, and I shall be delighted if you will look over my collection, which I think that I may without exaggeration describe as the best in Europe. And so no doubt it was. He had a huge oaken cabinet arranged in shallow drawers, and here, neatly ticketed and classified, were beetles from every corner of the earth, black, brown, blue, green, and mottled. Every now and then, as he swept his hand over the lines and lines of impaled insects, he would catch up some rare specimen, and, handling it with as much delicacy and reverence as if it were a precious relic, he would hold forth upon its peculiarities and the circumstances under which it came into his possession. 
it was evidently an unusual thing for him to meet with a sympathetic listener and he talked and talked until the spring evening had deepened into night and the gong announced that it was time to dress for dinner all the time lord linchmere said nothing but he stood at his brother-in-law's elbow and i caught him continually shooting curious little questioning glances into his face and his own features expressed some strong emotion apprehension sympathy expectation i seemed to read them all i was sure that lord linchmere was fearing something and awaiting something but what that something might be i could not imagine the evening passed quietly but pleasantly and i should have been entirely at my ease if it had not been for the continual sense of tension upon the part of lord linchmere as to our host i found that he improved upon acquaintance he spoke constantly with affection of his absent wife and also of his little son who had recently been sent to school the house he said was not the same without them if it were not for his scientific studies he did not know how he could get through the days after dinner we smoked for some time in the billiard-room and finally went to bed and then it was that for the first time the suspicion that lord linchmere was a lunatic crossed my mind he followed me into my bedroom when our host had retired doctor said he speaking in a low hurried voice you must come with me you must spend the night in my bedroom what do you mean i prefer not to explain but this is part of your duties my room is close by and you can return to your own before the servant calls you in the morning but why i asked because i am nervous of being alone said he that's the reason since you must have a reason it seemed rank lunacy but the argument of those twenty pounds would overcome many objections i followed him to his room well said i there's only room for one in that bed only one shall occupy it said he and the other must remain on watch why said i one would think you expected to be attacked well perhaps i do in that case why not lock your door perhaps i want to be attacked it looked more and more like lunacy however there was nothing for it but to submit i shrugged my shoulders and sat down in the armchair beside the empty fireplace i am to remain on watch then said i ruefully we will divide the night if you will watch until two i will watch the remainder very good call me at two o'clock then i will do so keep your ears open and if you hear any sounds wake me instantly instantly you hear you can rely upon it i tried to look as solemn as he did and for god's sake don't go to sleep said he and so taking off only his coat he threw the coverlet over him and settled down for the night it was a melancholy vigil and made more so by my own sense of its folly supposing that by any chance lord linchmere had cause to suspect that he was subject to danger in the house of sir thomas rossiter why on earth could he not lock his door and so protect himself his own answer that he might wish to be attacked was absurd why should he possibly wish to be attacked and who would wish to attack him clearly lord linchmere was suffering from some singular delusion and the result was that on an imbecile pretext i was to be deprived of my night's rest still however absurd i was determined to carry out his injunctions to the letter as long as i was in his employment i sat therefore beside the empty fireplace and listened to a sonorous chiming clock somewhere down the passage which gurgled and struck every quarter of an hour it was an endless vigil save for that single clock an absolute silence reigned throughout the great house a small lamp stood on the table at my elbow throwing a circle of light round my chair but leaving the corners of the room draped in shadow on the bed lord linchmere was breathing peacefully i envied him his quiet sleep and again and again my own eyelids drooped but every time my sense of duty came to my help and i sat up rubbing my eyes and pinching myself with the determination to see my irrational watch to an end 
and i did so from down the passage came the chimes of two o'clock and i laid my hand upon the shoulder of the sleeper instantly he was sitting up with an expression of the keenest interest upon his face you have heard something no sir it is two o'clock very good i will watch you can go to sleep i lay down under the coverlet as he had done and was soon unconscious my last recollection was of that circle of lamplight and of the small hunched-up figure and strained anxious face of lord lynchmere in the centre of it how long i slept i do not know but i was suddenly aroused by a sharp tug at my sleeve the room was in darkness but a hot smell of oil told me that the lamp had only that instant been extinguished quick quick said lord lynchmere's voice in my ear i sprang out of the bed he still dragging at my arm over here he whispered and pulled me into a corner of the room hush listen in the silence of the night i could distinctly hear that some one was coming down the corridor it was a stealthy step faint and intermittent as of a man who paused cautiously after every stride sometimes for half a minute there was no sound and then came the shuffle and creak which told of a fresh advance my companion was trembling with excitement his hand which still held my sleeve twitched like a branch in the wind what is it i whispered it's he sir thomas yes what does he want hush do nothing till i tell you i was conscious now that someone was trying the door there was the faintest little rattle from the handle and then i dimly saw a thin slit of subdued light there was a lamp burning somewhere far down the passage and it just sufficed to make the outside visible from the darkness of our room the grayish slit grew broader and broader very gradually very gently and then outlined against it i saw the dark figure of a man he was squat and crouching with the silhouette of a bulky and misshapen dwarf slowly the door swung open with this ominous shape framed in the center of it and then in an instant the crouching figure shot up there was a tiger spring across the room and thud 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 came three tremendous blows from some heavy object upon the bed i was so paralyzed with amazement that i stood motionless and staring until i was aroused by a yell for help from my companion the open door shed enough light for me to see the outline of things and there was little lord lynchmere with his arms round the neck of his brother-in-law holding bravely on to him like a game bull terrier with its teeth into a gaunt deerhound the tall bony man dashed himself about writhing round and round to get a grip upon his assailant but the other clutching on from behind still kept his hold though his shrill frightened cries showed how unequal he felt the contest to be i sprang to the rescue and the two of us managed to throw sir thomas to the ground though he made his teeth meet in my shoulder with all my youth and weight and strength it was a desperate struggle before we could master his frenzied struggles but at last we secured his arms with the waistcoat of the dressing-gown which he was wearing i was holding his legs while lord lynchmere was endeavouring to relight the lamp when there came the pattering of many feet in the passage and the butler and two footmen who had been alarmed by the cries rushed into the room with their aid we had no further difficulty in securing our prisoner who lay foaming and glaring upon the ground one glance at his face was enough to prove that he was a dangerous maniac while the short heavy hammer which lay beside the bed showed how murderous had been his intentions do not use any violence said lord lynchmere as we raised the struggling man to his feet he will have a period of stupor after this excitement i believe that it is coming on already as he spoke the convulsions became less violent and the madman's head fell forward upon his breast as if he were overcome by sleep we led him down the passage and stretched him upon his own bed where he lay unconscious breathing heavily two of you will watch him said lord lynchmere 
and now dr hamilton if you will return with me to my room i will give you the explanation which my horror of scandal has perhaps caused me to delay too long come what may you will never have cause to regret your share in this night's work the case may be made clear in a very few words he continued when we were alone my poor brother-in-law is one of the best fellows upon earth a loving husband and an estimable father but he comes from a stock which is deeply tainted with insanity he has more than once had homicidal outbreaks which are the more painful because his inclination is always to attack the very person to whom he is most attached his son was sent away to school to avoid this danger and then came an attempt upon my sister his wife from which she escaped with injuries that you may have observed when you met her in london you understand that he knows nothing of the matter when he is in his sound senses and would ridicule the suggestion that he could under any circumstances injure those whom he loves so dearly it is often as you know a characteristic of such maladies that it is absolutely impossible to convince the man who suffers from them of their existence our great object was of course to get him under restraint before he could stain his hands with blood but the matter was full of difficulty he is a recluse in his habits and would not see any medical man besides it was necessary for our purpose that the medical man should convince himself of his insanity and he is sane as you or i save on these very rare occasions but fortunately before he has had these attacks he always shows certain premonitory symptoms which are providential danger signals warning us to be upon our guard the chief of these is that nervous contortion of the forehead which you must have observed this is a phenomenon which always appears from three to four days before his attacks of frenzy the moment it showed itself his wife came into town on some pretext and took refuge in my house in brook street it remained for me to convince a medical man of sir thomas's insanity without which it was impossible to put him where he could do no harm the first problem was how to get a medical man into his house i bethought me of his interest in beetles and his love for any one who shared his tastes i advertised therefore and was fortunate enough to find in you the very man i wanted a stout companion was necessary for i knew that the lunacy could only be proved by a murderous assault and i had every reason to believe that that assault would be made upon myself since he had the warmest regard for me in his moments of sanity i think your intelligence will supply all the rest i did not know that the attack would come by night but i thought it very probable for the crises of such cases usually do occur in the early hours of the morning i am a very nervous man myself but i saw no other way in which i could remove this terrible danger from my sister's life i need not ask you whether you are willing to sign the lunacy papers undoubtedly but two signatures are necessary you forget that i am myself a holder of a medical degree i have the papers on a side table here so if you will be good enough to sign them now we can have the patient removed in the morning so that was my visit to sir thomas rossiter the famous beetle hunter and that was also my first step upon the ladder of success for lady rossiter and lord lynchmere have proved to be staunch friends and they have never forgotten my association with them in the time of their need sir thomas is out and said to be cured but i still think that if i spent another night at delamere court i should be inclined to lock my door upon the inside End of story two. Story three of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story three The Man with the Watches there are many who will still bear in mind the singular circumstances which under the heading of the rugby mystery filled many columns of the daily press in the spring of the year eighteen ninety two 
coming as it did at a period of exceptional dullness it attracted perhaps rather more attention than it deserved but it offered to the public that mixture of the whimsical and the tragic which is most stimulating to the popular imagination interest drooped however when after weeks of fruitless investigation it was found that no final explanation of the facts was forthcoming and the tragedy seemed from that time to the present to have finally taken its place in the dark catalogue of inexplicable and unexpiated crimes a recent communication the authenticity of which appears to be above question has however thrown some new and clear light upon the matter before laying it before the public it would be as well perhaps that i should refresh their memories as to the singular facts upon which this commentary is founded these facts were briefly as follows at five o'clock on the evening of the eighteenth of march in the year already mentioned a train left euston station for manchester it was a rainy squally day which grew wilder as it progressed so it was by no means the weather in which any one would travel who was not driven to do so by necessity the train however is a favourite one among manchester businessmen who are returning from town for it does the journey in four hours and twenty minutes with only three stoppages upon the way in spite of the inclement evening it was therefore fairly well filled upon the occasion of which i speak the guard of the train was a tried servant of the company a man who had worked for twenty-two years without blemish or complaint his name was john palmer the station clock was upon the stroke of five and the guard was about to give the customary signal to the engine driver when he observed two belated passengers hurrying down the platform the one was an exceptionally tall man dressed in a long black overcoat with astrakhan collar and cuffs i have already said that the evening was an inclement one and the tall traveller had the high warm collar turned up to protect his throat against the bitter march wind he appeared as far as the guard could judge by so hurried an inspection to be a man between fifty and sixty years of age who had retained a good deal of the vigour and activity of his youth in one hand he carried a brown leather gladstone bag his companion was a lady tall and erect walking with a vigorous step which outpaced the gentleman beside her she wore a long fawn-coloured dust cloak a black close-fitting toque and a dark veil which concealed the greater part of her face the two might very well have passed as father and daughter they walked swiftly down the line of carriages glancing in at the windows until the guard john palmer overtook them now then sir look sharp the train is going said he first class the man answered the guard turned the handle of the nearest door in the carriage which he had opened there sat a small man with a cigar in his mouth his appearance seems to have impressed itself upon the guard's memory for he was prepared afterwards to describe or to identify him he was a man of thirty-four or thirty-five years of age dressed in some grey material sharp-nosed alert with a ruddy weather-beaten face and a small closely cropped black beard he glanced up as the door was opened the tall man paused with his foot upon the step this is a smoking compartment the lady dislikes smoke said he looking round at the guard all right here you are sir said john palmer he slammed the door of the smoking carriage opened that of the next one which was empty and thrust the two travellers in at the same moment he sounded his whistle and the wheels of the train began to move the man with the cigar was at the window of his carriage and said something to the guard as he rolled past him but the words were lost in the bustle of the departure palmer stepped into the guard's van as it came up to him and thought no more of the incident twelve minutes after its departure the train reached williston junction where it stopped for a very short interval an examination of the tickets has made it certain that no one either joined or left it at this time and no passenger was seen to alight upon the platform at five fourteen the journey to manchester was resumed and rugby was reached at six fifty the express being five minutes late 
at rugby the attention of the station officials was drawn to the fact that the door of one of the first-class carriages was open an examination of that compartment and of its neighbor disclosed a remarkable state of affairs the smoking carriage in which the short red-faced man with the black beard had been seen was now empty save for a half-smoked cigar there was no trace whatever of its recent occupant the door of this carriage was fastened in the next compartment to which attention had been originally drawn there was no sign either of the gentleman with the astrakhan collar or of the young lady who accompanied him all three passengers had disappeared on the other hand there was found upon the floor of this carriage the one in which the tall traveller and the lady had been a young man fashionably dressed and of elegant appearance he lay with his knees drawn up and his head resting against the further door an elbow upon either seat a bullet had penetrated his heart and his death must have been instantaneous no one had seen such a man enter the train and no railway ticket was found in his pocket neither were there any markings upon his linen nor paper nor personal property which might help to identify him who he was whence he had come and how he had met his end were each as great a mystery as what had occurred to the three people who had started an hour and a half before from williston in those two compartments i have said that there was no personal property which might help to identify him but it is true that there was one peculiarity about this unknown young man which was much commented upon at the time in his pockets were found no fewer than six valuable gold watches three in the various pockets of his waistcoat one in his ticket pocket one in his breast pocket and one small one set in a leather strap and fastened round his left wrist the obvious explanation that the man was a pickpocket and that this was his plunder was discounted by the fact that all six were of american make and of a type which is rare in england three of them bore the mark of the rochester watchmaking company one was by mason of elmira one was unmarked and the small one which was highly jewelled and ornamented was from tiffany of new york the other contents of his pocket consisted of an ivory knife with a corkscrew by rogers of sheffield a small circular mirror one inch in diameter a readmission slip to the lyceum theatre a silver box full of vesta matches and a brown leather cigar case containing two cheroots also two pounds fourteen shillings in money it was clear then that whatever motives may have led to his death robbery was not among them as already mentioned there were no markings upon the man's linen which appeared to be new and no tailor's name upon his coat in appearance he was young short smooth-cheeked and delicately featured one of his front teeth was conspicuously stopped with gold on the discovery of the tragedy an examination was instantly made of the tickets of all passengers and the number of the passengers themselves was counted it was found that only three tickets were unaccounted for corresponding to the three travellers who were missing the express was then allowed to proceed but a new guard was sent with it and john palmer was detained as a witness at rugby the carriage which included the two compartments in question was uncoupled and sidetracked then on the arrival of inspector vane of scotland yard and of mr henderson a detective in the service of the railway company an exhaustive inquiry was made into all the circumstances that crime had been committed was certain the bullet which appeared to have come from a small pistol or revolver had been fired from some little distance as there was no scorching of the clothes no weapon was found in the compartment which finally disposed of the theory of suicide nor was there any sign of the brown leather bag which the guard had seen in the hand of the tall gentleman a lady's parasol was found upon the rack but no other trace was to be seen of the travellers in either of the sections
apart from the crime the question of how or why three passengers one of them a lady could get out of the train and one other get in during the unbroken run between williston and rugby was one which excited the utmost curiosity among the general public and gave rise to much speculation in the london press john palmer the guard was able at the inquest to give some evidence which threw a little light upon the matter there was a spot between tring and cheddington according to his statement where on account of some repairs to the line the train had for a few minutes slowed down to a pace not exceeding eight or ten miles an hour at that place it might be possible for a man or even for an exceptionally active woman to have left the train without serious injury it was true that a gang of plate layers was there and that they had seen nothing but it was their custom to stand in the middle between the metals and the open carriage door was upon the far side so that it was conceivable that some one might have alighted unseen as the darkness would by that time be drawing in a steep embankment would instantly screen any one who sprang out from the observation of the navvies the guard also deposed that there was a good deal of movement upon the platform at williston junction and that though it was certain that no one had either joined or left the train there it was still quite possible that some of the passengers might have changed unseen from one compartment to another it was by no means uncommon for a gentleman to finish his cigar in a smoking carriage and then to change to a clearer atmosphere supposing that the man with the black beard had done so at williston and the half-smoked cigar upon the floor seemed to favor the supposition he would naturally go into the nearest section which would bring him into the company of the two other actors in the drama thus the first stage of the affair might be surmised without any great breach of probability but what the second stage had been or how the final one had been arrived at neither the guard nor the experienced detective officers could suggest a careful examination of the line between williston and rugby resulted in one discovery which might or might not have a bearing upon the tragedy near tring at the very place where the train slowed down there was found at the bottom of the embankment a small pocket testament very shabby and worn it was printed by the bible society of london and bore an inscription from john to alice january thirteenth eighteen fifty six upon the fly-leaf underneath was written james july fourth eighteen fifty nine and beneath that again edward november first eighteen sixty nine all the entries being in the same handwriting this was the only clue if it could be called the clue which the police obtained and the coroner's verdict of murder by a person or persons unknown was the unsatisfactory ending of a singular case advertisement rewards and inquiries proved equally fruitless and nothing could be found which was solid enough to form the basis for a profitable investigation it would be a mistake however to suppose that no theories were formed to account for the facts on the contrary the press both in england and in america teemed with suggestions and suppositions most of which were obviously absurd the fact that the watches were of american make and some peculiarities in connection with the gold stopping of his front tooth appeared to indicate that the deceased was a citizen of the united states though his linen clothes and boots were undoubtedly of british manufacture it was surmised by some that he was concealed under the seat and that being discovered he was for some reason possibly because he had overheard their guilty secrets put to death by his fellow-passengers when coupled with generalities as to the ferocity and cunning of anarchical and other secret societies this theory sounded as plausible as any the fact that he should be without a ticket would be consistent with the idea of concealment and it was well known that women played a prominent part in the nihilistic propaganda on the other hand it was clear from the guard's statement that the man must have been hidden there before the others arrived and how unlikely the coincidence that conspirators should stray exactly into the very compartment in which a spy was already concealed besides 
this explanation ignored the man in the smoking carriage and gave no reason at all for his simultaneous disappearance the police had little difficulty in showing that such a theory would not cover the fact but they were unprepared in the absence of evidence to advance any alternative explanation there was a letter in the daily gazette over the signature of a well-known criminal investigator which gave rise to considerable discussion at the time he had formed a hypothesis which had at least ingenuity to recommend it and i cannot do better than append it in his own words whatever may be the truth said he it must depend upon some bizarre and rare combination of events so we need have no hesitation in postulating such events in our explanation in the absence of data we must abandon the analytic or scientific method of investigation and must approach it in the synthetic fashion in a word instead of taking down events and deducing from them what has happened we must build up a fanciful explanation if it will only be consistent with known events we can then test this explanation by any fresh facts which may arise if they all fit into their places the probability is that we are upon the right track and with each fresh fact this probability increases in a geometrical progression until the evidence becomes final and convincing now there is one most remarkable and suggestive fact which has not met with the attention which it deserves there is a local train running through harrow and king's langley which is timed in such a way that the express must have overtaken it at or about the period when it eased down its speed to eight miles an hour on account of the repairs of the line the two trains would at that time be travelling in the same direction at a similar rate of speed and upon parallel lines it is within every one's experience how under such circumstances the occupant of each carriage can see very plainly the passengers in the other carriages opposite to him the lamps of the express had been lit at williston so that each compartment was brightly illuminated and most visible to an observer from outside now the sequence of events as i reconstruct them would be after this fashion this young man with the abnormal number of watches was alone in the carriage of the slow train his ticket with his papers and gloves and other things was we will suppose on the seat beside him he was probably an american and also probably a man of weak intellect the excessive wearing of jewellery is an early symptom in some forms of mania as he sat watching the carriage of the express which were on account of the state of the line going at the same pace as himself he suddenly saw some people in it whom he knew we will suppose for the sake of our theory that these people were a woman whom he loved and a man whom he hated and who in return hated him the young man was excitable and impulsive he opened the door of his carriage stepped from the footboard of the local train to the footboard of the express opened the other door and made his way into the presence of these two people the feat on the supposition that the trains were going at the same pace is by no means so perilous as it might appear having now got our young man without his ticket into the carriage in which the elder man and young woman were travelling it is not difficult to imagine that a violent scene ensued it is possible that the pair were also americans which is the more probable as the man carried a weapon an unusual thing in england if our supposition of incipient mania is correct the young man is likely to have assaulted the other as the upshot of the quarrel the elder man shot the intruder and then made his escape from the carriage taking the young lady with him we will suppose that all this happened very rapidly and that the train was still going at so slow a pace that it was not difficult for them to leave it a woman might leave a train going at eight miles an hour as a matter of fact we know that this woman did do so and now we have to fit in the man in the smoking carriage presuming that we have up to this point reconstructed the tragedy correctly we shall find nothing in this other man to cause us to reconsider our conclusions 
according to my theory this man saw the young fellow cross from one train to the other saw him open the door heard the pistol shot saw the two fugitives spring out on to the line realized that murder had been done and sprang out himself in pursuit why he has never been heard of since whether he met his own death in the pursuit or whether as is more likely he was made to realize that it was not a case for his interference is a detail which we have at present no means of explaining i acknowledge that there are some difficulties in the way at first sight it might seem improbable that at such a moment a murderer would burden himself in his flight with a brown leather bag my answer is that he was well aware that if the bag were found his identity would be established it was absolutely necessary for him to take it with him my theory stands or falls upon one point and i call upon the railway company to make strict inquiry as to whether a ticket was found unclaimed in the local train through harrow and king's langley upon the eighteenth of march if such a ticket were found my case is proved if not my theory may still be the correct one for it is conceivable either that he travelled without a ticket or that his ticket was lost to this elaborate and plausible hypothesis the answer of the police and of the company was first that no such ticket was found secondly that the slow train would never run parallel to the express and thirdly that the local train had been stationary in king's langley station when the express going at fifty miles an hour had flashed past it so perished the only satisfying explanation and five years have elapsed without supplying a new one now at last there comes a statement which covers all the facts and which must be regarded as authentic it took the shape of a letter dated from new york and addressed to the same criminal investigator whose theory i have quoted it is given here in extenso with the exception of the two opening paragraphs which are personal in their nature you'll excuse me if i'm not very free with names there's less reason now than there was five years ago when mother was still living but for all that i had rather cover up our tracks all i can but i owe you an explanation for if your idea of it was wrong it was a mighty ingenious one all the same I'll have to go back a little so as you may understand all about it. My people come from Bucks, England, and emigrated to the States in the early fifties. They settled in Rochester in the state of New York, where my father ran a large dry goods store. There were only two sons, myself, James, and my brother Edward. I was ten years older than my brother, and after my father died I sort of took the place of my father to him as an elder brother would. He was a bright, spirited boy, and just one of the most beautiful creatures that ever lived. But there was always a soft spot in him, and it was like mold in cheese, for it spread and spread, and nothing that you could do would stop it mother saw it just as clearly as i did but she went on spoiling him all the same for he had such a way with him that you could refuse him nothing i did all i could to hold him in and he hated me for my pains at last he fairly got his head and nothing that we could do would stop him he got off into new york and went rapidly from bad to worse at first he was only fast and then he was criminal and then at the end of a year or two he was one of the most notorious young crooks in the city he had formed a friendship with sparrow mccoy who was at the head of his profession as a bunco steerer green goodsman and general rascal they took to card sharping and frequented some of the best hotels in new york my brother was an excellent actor he might have made an honest name for himself if he had chosen and he would take the parts of a young englishman of title of a simple lad from the west or of a college undergraduate whichever suited sparrow mccoy's purpose and then one day he dressed himself as a girl and he carried it off so well and made himself such a valuable decoy that it was their favorite game afterwards they had made it right with tammany and with the police so it seemed as if nothing could ever stop them 
for those were in the days before the Legzow Commission, and if you only had a pull, you could do pretty nearly everything you wanted. And nothing would have stopped them if they had only stuck to cards and New York, but they must needs come up Rochester way and forge a name upon a check. It was my brother that did it, though everyone knew that it was under the influence of Sparrow McCoy. I bought up that check, and a pretty sum it cost me. Then I went to my brother, laid it before him on the table, and swore to him that I would prosecute if he did not clear out of the country. At first he simply laughed. I could not prosecute, he said, without breaking our mother's heart, and he knew that I would not do that. I made him understand, however, that our mother's heart was being broken in any case, and that I had set firm on the point that I would rather see him in a Rochester jail than in a New York hotel. So at last he gave in, and he made me a solemn promise that he would see Sparrow McCoy no more, that he would go to Europe, and that he would turn his hand to any honest trade that I helped him out to get. I took him down right away to an old family friend, Joe Wilson, who is an exporter of American watches and clocks, and I got him to give Edward an agency in London with a small salary and a fifteen per cent commission on all business. His manner and appearance were so good that he won the old man over at once, and within a week he was sent off to London with a case full of samples. It seemed to me that this business of the check had really given my brother a fright, and that there was some chance of his settling down into an honest line of life. My mother had spoken with him, and what she said had touched him, for she had always been the best of mothers to him, and he had been the great sorrow of her life. But I knew that this man, Sparrow McCoy, had a great influence over Edward, and my chance of keeping the lad straight lay in breaking the connection between them. I had a friend in the New York detective force, and through him I kept a watch upon McCoy. When, within a fortnight of my brother's sailing, I heard that McCoy had taken a berth in the Etruria, I was as certain as if he had told me that he was going over to England for the purpose of coaxing Edward back into the ways that he had left. In an instant I had resolved to go also and to put my influence against McCoy's. I knew it was a losing fight, but I thought, and my mother thought, that it was my duty. We passed the last night together in prayer for my success, and she gave me her own testament that my father had given her on the day of their marriage in the old country, so that I might always wear it next my heart. I was a fellow traveller on the steamship with Sparrow McCoy, and at least I had the satisfaction of spoiling his little game for the voyage. The very first night I went into the smoking-room and found him at the head of a card-table with half a dozen young fellows who were carrying their full purses and their empty skulls over to Europe. He was settling down for his harvest, and a rich one it would have been, but I soon changed all that. "'Gentlemen,' said I, "'are you aware whom you are playing with?' "'What's that to you? You mind your own business,' said he with an oath. "'Who is it, anyway?' asked one of the dudes. "'He's Sparrow McCoy, the most notorious card-sharper in the States.' Up he jumped with a bottle in his hand, but he remembered that he was under the flag of the effete old country, where law and order run, and Tammany has no pull. Jail and the gallows wait for violence and murder, and there's no slipping out by the back door on board an ocean liner. "'Prove your words, you,' said he. "'I will,' said I, "'if you will turn up your right shirt-sleeve to the shoulder, I will either prove my words or I will eat them.' He turned white and said not a word. You see, I knew something of his ways, and I was aware that part of the mechanism which he and all such sharpers use consists of an elastic down the arm with a clip just above the wrist. It is by means of this clip that they withdraw from their hands the cards which they do not want, while they substitute other cards from another hiding place. I reckoned on it being there, and it was. He cursed me, slunk out of the saloon, and was hardly seen again during the voyage. For once, at any rate, I got level with Mr. Sparrow McCoy. But he soon had his revenge upon me, for when it came to influencing my brother, 
he outweighed me every time edward had kept himself straight in london for the first few weeks and had done some business with his american watches until this villain came across his path once more i did my best but the best was little enough the next thing i heard there had been a scandal at one of the northumberland avenue hotels a traveller had been fleeced of a large sum by two confederate card sharpers and the matter was in the hands of scotland yard the first i learned of it was in the evening paper and i was at once certain that my brother and mccoy were back at their old games i hurried at once to edward's lodgings they told me that he and a tall gentleman whom i recognized as mccoy had gone off together and that he had left the lodgings and taken his things with him the landlady had heard them give several directions to the cabman ending with euston station and she had accidentally overheard the tall gentleman saying something about manchester she believed that that was their destination a glance at the time-table showed me that the most likely train was at five though there was another at four thirty five which they might have caught i had only time to get the later one but found no sign of them either at the depot or in the train they must have gone on by the earlier one so i determined to follow them to manchester and search for them in the hotels there one last appeal to my brother by all that he owed to my mother might even now be the salvation of him my nerves were overstrung and i lit a cigar to steady them at that moment just as the train was moving off the door of my compartment was flung open and there were mccoy and my brother on the platform they were both disguised and with good reason for they knew that the london police were after them mccoy had a great astrakhan collar drawn up so that only his eyes and nose were showing my brother was dressed like a woman with a black veil half down his face but of course it did not deceive me for an instant nor would it have done so even if i had not known that he often used such a dress before i started up and as i did so mccoy recognized me he said something the conductor slammed the door and they were shown into the next compartment i tried to stop the train so as to follow them but the wheels were already moving and it was too late when we stopped at williston i instantly changed my carriage it appears that i was not seen to do so which is not surprising as the station was crowded with people mccoy of course was expecting me and he had spent the time between euston and williston in saying all he could to harden my brother's heart and set him against me that is what i fancy for i had never found him so impossible to soften or to move i tried this way and i tried that i pictured his future in an english jail i described the sorrow of his mother when i came back with the news i said everything to touch his heart but all to no purpose he sat there with a fixed sneer upon his handsome face while every now and then sparrow mccoy would throw in a taunt at me or some word of encouragement to hold my brother to his resolutions why don't you run a sunday school he would say to me and then in the same breath he thinks you have no will of your own he thinks you are just the baby brother and that he can lead you where he likes he's only just finding out that you are a man as well as he it was those words of his which set me talking bitterly we had left williston you understand for all this took some time my temper got the better of me and for the first time in my life i let my brother see the rough side of me perhaps it would have been better had i done so earlier and more often a man said i well i'm glad to have your friend's assurance of it for no one would suspect it to see you like a boarding-school missy i don't suppose in all this country there is a more contemptible-looking creature than you are as you sit there with that dolly pinafore upon you he coloured up at that for he was a vain man and he winced from ridicule it's only a dust cloak said he and he slipped it off one has to throw the coppers off one scent and i had no other way to do it he took his toque off with the veil attached and he put both it and the cloak into his brown bag anyway i don't need to wear it until the conductor comes round said he 
nor then either said i and taking the bag i slung it with all my force out of the window now said i you'll never make a merry jane of yourself while i can help it if nothing but that disguise stands between you and a jail then to jail you shall go that was the way to manage him i felt my advantage at once his supple nature was one which yielded to roughness far more readily than to entreaty he flushed with shame and his eyes filled with tears but mccoy saw my advantage also and was determined that i should not pursue it he's my pard and you shall not bully him he cried he's my brother and you shall not ruin him said i i believe a spell of prison is the very best way of keeping you apart and you shall have it or it will be no fault of mine oh you would squeal would you he cried and in an instant he whipped out his revolver i sprang for his hand but saw that i was too late and jumped aside at the same instant he fired and the bullet which would have struck me passed through the heart of my unfortunate brother he dropped without a groan upon the floor of the compartment and mccoy and i equally horrified knelt at each side of him trying to bring back some signs of life mccoy still held the loaded revolver in his hand but his anger against me and my resentment towards him had both for the moment been swallowed up in this sudden tragedy it was he who first realized the situation the train was for some reason going very slowly at the moment and he saw his opportunity for escape in an instant he had the door open but i was as quick as he and jumping upon him the two of us fell off the footboard and rolled in each other's arms down a steep embankment at the bottom i struck my head against a stone and i remembered nothing more when i came to myself i was lying among some low bushes not far from the railroad track and somebody was bathing my head with a wet handkerchief it was sparrow mccoy i guess i couldn't leave you said he i didn't want to have the blood of two of you on my hands in one day you loved your brother i've no doubt but you didn't love him a cent more than i loved him though you'll say that i took a queer way to show it anyhow it seems a mighty empty world now that he is gone and i don't care a continental whether you give me over to the hangman or not he had turned his ankle in the fall and there we sat he with his useless foot and i with my throbbing head and we talked and talked until gradually my bitterness began to soften and to turn into something like sympathy what was the use of revenging his death upon a man who was as much stricken by that death as i was and then as my wits gradually returned i began to realize also that i could do nothing against mccoy which would not recoil upon my mother and myself how could we convict him without a full account of my brother's career being made public the very thing which of all others we wished to avoid it was really as much our interest as his to cover the matter up and from being an avenger of crime i found myself changed to a conspirator against justice the place in which we found ourselves was one of those pheasant preserves which are so common in the old country and as we groped our way through it i found myself consulting the slayer of my brother as to how far it would be possible to hush it up i soon realized from what he said that unless there were some papers of which we knew nothing in my brother's pockets there was really no possible means by which the police could identify him or learn how he had got there his ticket was in mccoy's pocket and so was the ticket for some baggage which they left in the depot like most americans he had found it cheaper and easier to buy an outfit in london than to bring one from new york so that all his linen and clothes were new and unmarked the bag containing the dust cloak which i had thrown out of the window may have fallen among some bramble patch where it is still concealed or it may have been carried off by some tramp or may have come into the possession of the police who kept the incident to themselves 
Anyhow, I have seen nothing about it in the London papers. As to the watches, they were a selection from those which had been entrusted to him for business purposes. It may have been for the same business purposes that he was taking them to Manchester, but, well, it's too late to enter into that. I don't blame the police for being at fault. I don't see how it could have been otherwise. There was just one little clue that they might have followed up, but it was a small one. I mean that small circular mirror which was found in my brother's pocket. It isn't a very common thing for a young man to carry about with him, is it? But a gambler might have told you what such a mirror may mean to a card sharper. If you sit back a little from the table and lay the mirror face upwards upon your lap, you can see, as you deal, every card that you give to your adversary. It is not hard to say whether you see a man or raise him when you know his cards as well as your own. It was as much a part of a sharper's outfit as the elastic clip upon Sparrow McCoy's arm. Taking that, in connection with the recent frauds at the hotels, the police might have got hold of one end of the string. I don't think there is much more for me to explain. We got to a village called Amersham that night in the character of two gentlemen upon a walking tour, and afterwards we made our way quietly to London, whence McCoy went on to Cairo and I returned to New York. My mother died six months afterwards, and I am glad to say that to the day of her death she never knew what happened. She was always under the delusion that Edward was earning an honest living in London, and I never had the heart to tell her the truth. He never wrote, but then he never did write at any time, so that made no difference. His name was the last upon her lips. There is just one other thing that I have to ask you, sir, and I should take it as a kind return for all this explanation if you could do it for me. You remember that testament that was picked up? I always carried it in my inside pocket, and it must have come out in my fall. I valued it very highly, for it was the family book with my birth and my brother's marked by my father in the beginning of it. I wish you would apply at the proper place and have it sent to me. It can be of no possible value to anyone else. If you address it to X, Bassanio's Library, Broadway, New York, it is sure to come to hand. End of Story 3